this is Lisa from Mobile Tech Review, and nothing says gamer like red and black, right? I know some of you really just hate gaming laptops that look like red and black gaming laptops. At least you get a little champagne accent here. This is the budget gamer model from Acer. It's the Aspire VX15, Intel 7th generation CPU inside and NVIDIA Pascal. You can get this with the GTX 1050 or 1050 Ti. And the neat thing about this is, you know how it used to be, folks would ask me, I want a gaming laptop for under $1,000. And I'd be like, well, good luck with that if you really want to play today's most demanding titles. Now it's possible, largely thanks to the great generational leap improvement in NVIDIA Pascal 10 series graphics cards. And manufacturers, you know, they're just finding a way to put more powerful parts into smaller places. So this sells for 800 bucks, and it has an Intel quad-core CPU inside. It's the Core i5 version. You can get it with Core i7, 8 gigs of RAM, and a 256 gig SSD for that price and a 1080p IPS display. I mean, now we're talking here. We're gonna look at it now. So the Acer Aspire VX15 is available in many configurations. You know Acer, if you look at their website, they have sometimes a mind-boggling number of options. There aren't too, too many for this one. So this is the $799 one. That gets you the Intel Core i5-7300 HQ, the same CPU we saw in the Dell Inspiron 15 Gaming Edition, and the NVIDIA GTX 1050 with four gigabytes of GDDR5 VRAM. You get a 256 gig SSD inside. Now this is a light on brand SSD for those of you who care about brand. It goes into the M2 slot and it uses SATA interface. There's no PCIe NVMe support here as far as I can tell. There are also configurations with a spinning two and a half inch hard drive and there's a bay for the hard drive and there's an M2 slot inside. If you want to spend a little bit more, you can go up to the 1050 Ti for $100 more, $899. And then there's a Core i7 H 7700 HQ with 16 gigs of DDR4 RAM and the 1050 Ti again for $1,049, which is a real nice kind of power user configuration there. All of these have a 1920 by 1080 display. Ours is IPS. There was a sticker on the deck that said IPS. For sure, it's IPS. I know there's some reviews of some models that said that there were TN panels out there. That's not what we have. And the, the ones that are currently listed on Acer's website say IPS panel. So there's that. And, and that's an important thing because if you're also considering the Dell Inspiron Gamer, well, that one has a pretty mediocre, and that's being generous, TN panel for the 1080p panel. And if you want something that actually has reasonable viewing angles and better brightness and all that sort of thing, you have to jump up to 4K, which might be a leap a lot of folks don't want to do if really gaming is their primary purpose for this. The casing is indeed rigid, fantastic plastic. It's not going to be metal hardly ever do we see other than Razer gaming laptops that are made of metal. Uh, faux brushed something or other surface on the lid. Obvious, plenty of red highlights, that big red grill, the champagne bar along the back to give it a little bit of a look. If you like the look of a gaming laptop, I would say this is a good looking gaming laptop. If you abhor the whole red and black and flashy lines kind of thing, then it's not for you. It is pretty compact though, which is nice. For those of you who are thinking about taking this with you on the go, students, that sort of thing, it has a fairly small footprint for a 15.6 inch gaming laptop and it's not too thick either, being around an inch thick or so. The weight's also not bad. It's five and a half pounds or two and a half kilograms. So definitely a good portable product. Ports are reasonably good at this price range. Of course, you got your combo mic headphone jack, a full-size SD card slot, a USB 2.0 port, two USB 3.0 ports, and a USB-C 3.1 Gen 1 port. No Thunderbolt 3 here in this price range. Nope, nope, sorry about that. You ain't gonna get it. You do get gigabit ethernet, however, and HDMI out. And if you want something like display port, you can use that USB-C port to do display port. Now, how about heat and noise? Well, these big gaudy grills here, they are effective, and you'll see the internals soon, and you'll see that there are actually quite large fans in here, two of them, one for the CPU, one for the GPU. And on the bottom, we have wavy ventilation lines as well. And then on the side, no, no, nothing on the side. That's perfectly adequate. The 1050 and 1050 Ti do not get that hot. This really is kind of overbuilt for cooling, in fact, and even when playing games, you hear the fan, but really not so much. It's very impressive. 
And in terms of thermals, there's almost no point to show you thermal heat maps because the thing doesn't exceed human body temperature, top surface nor bottom surface. So it's definitely a cool customer and a fairly quiet one. And Acer does a good job with that. You know, we reviewed the Predator 17. And in fact, I bought one for myself back in the holiday season when they're having fantastic sales on them. And one of the things I like about it is the fact that it's relatively cool and relatively quiet, even among the big 17-inch gaming laptops. So good job there, Acer. To take the bottom cover off, you remove about 15 or so of these little Phillips head screws. It's pretty easy to figure out where they are on the bottom. And then you have to pry. And boy, is there a lot of prying. I use a guitar pick. It works pretty well. I just get a stiff one, not one of the super thin ones meant for a Telecaster riff. Get one for acoustic guitar. Take it off. Got that liner in here. And there you have the internals. So there's our battery, obviously, that big thing right there. Now we have the SSD only model. So there's our M2 SATA SSD right there, 256 gig light on. This is where the hard drive would go if you went with the hard drive option. Again, you can get it with a hard drive only, with a hard drive and an SSD. There's many configurations available. Two RAM slots, we have eight gigs in our model, so we have one 8 gig DIMM. You can obviously easily double it to 16, or if you're adventurous, you could put two 16 gig modules in here. Two beefy fans. These are nice, large, high quality fans. They're pretty quiet at all times, too. The, the GTX 1050 is not the hottest, most taxing of GPUs out there. Really, this kind of build could even handle a 1060 pretty nicely, and certainly the TI, 1050 TI, that's also an option there. And here's our usual socketed Wi-Fi card here, which is a Qualcomm Athros card again. Coin cell battery, laptops have them. So that's the internals. Oh, and hey, the front-facing speakers are pretty good size here, and it's an intelligent placement. The keyboard is backlit in what Acer calls iron red. Okay, red, right? And obviously you have your WASD keys here permanently highlighted like Acer likes to do with the Rogue series. So some of you like that, some of you don't. It's effective backlighting. It's a very nice keyboard. There's 1.5 millimeters of key travel on this, and it's quiet and it's damped. It doesn't feel clattery. It responds pretty well when gaming, though I admit, being left-handed, I tend to use a controller a lot when I play games. You do have a number pad here, so some people love the number pad, some people don't. I personally would be happier without it, but uh, mostly because I like to have a bigger gap so I don't accidentally wander over into this section, which is something that's not possible in the 15-inch notebook, a 17-inch shirt. Everything is pretty normally laid out. You've got your FN key to activate your brightness and your volume controls here. The only thing that's a little weird is the delete key. The Dell key is over here instead of where the home key is, so I tend to reach for the wrong thing all the time. The keyboard deck is very stiff. I, I, there's just no way I can really get much movement pushing down with my finger. I am pressing hard right now, folks, and if you don't see anything moving, that's because it just doesn't move. So overall, good job with the keyboard there, Acer. The trackpad is outlined, obviously, in red, and it is a buttonless one. I prefer the button trackpad that they use in the Predator series, but hey, this has to be less expensive, so you don't get any nice soft touch discrete buttons here. The trackpad is made by Elan. They used to make hideous trackpads. Now they don't make hideous trackpads. It's an okay trackpad. The only thing I'm not too fond of is the, the kind of stiff clickers that make it a little bit hard to do things, but multi-touch gestures, that sort of thing, that works just fine on it. Front-facing stereo speakers in this area here behind these grills, which is an intelligent placement, and my god, these things are loud. Even at 50% volume, I booted this up, it made a system notification sound really jumped out of my drawers, let me tell you, loud. And it's full sounding too. It, it's not brash, it's not tinny. You've got Dolby software inside to help improve audio quality as well. It's really fantastic. And for a gaming and multimedia laptop, that's a pretty important feature that's often neglected, especially in budget laptops. So good job there. The full HD 1920 by 1080 IPS matte non-touch display is good for the price tag. Let's put it that way. In terms of color gamut, it's not going to wow you, but it's perfectly decent, actually, when playing games because you just can't expect the most in eye candy. It sort of reminds me of the last generation Dell Inspiron Gamer 15, which had a pretty decent IPS panel for the price, unlike the, the newer generation, which we happen to have right here, just so you can see the difference. Same picture. This is a photograph I took. And because of the fact that the Dell has a TN panel, the, the, the color gamuts are similar on these, by the way. But look at how that disappears. When they're tilted back like that, the Acer is perfectly visible. The Dell turns into, oh my god. And if I bring the Dell up, you'll see it starts to look good. And then it'll start to disappear in the other way that TN panels do. 
Now our acer is tilted back and if I put it upright more it still looks fine and if you shift it forward it still looks fine. So there you go. That's why I applaud the Acer panel compared to the latest generation Inspiron Gamer. In terms of color gamut, it's, you know, it's not going to impress anybody. 63% of sRGB. We like to see something close to 100% on your everyday $1,000 Ultrabook gaming laptops because the internals cost more. You have to pay more to get a fancier panel. Brightness is decent at 268 nits and you can see the rest of the metrics up there on screen and the in fact, the, the white point is pretty good. The gamut's pretty good on it. It's just not a super wide gamut panel, but viewing angles are great. Brightness is great. And for the price, it's fine. So performance. Well, it's a gaming laptop and you're getting gaming laptop level performance here. Even with the Core i5 that we have, this 2.5 gigahertz Core i5-7300HQ, it's still a quad core 45 watt CPU. It's still quite powerful. And you can get the Core i7-7700HQ that's on every other higher end gaming laptop too if you want. Performance is good. The GTX 1050 is the beginning level of NVIDIA's, shall we call them, serious GPUs. The 1050 is not VR certified, nor is the 1050 Ti. You have to move up to the 1060, a more expensive kind of laptop, if you're going to go for that sort of thing. Acer's Predator line in this case, or the Asus Rogue GL series, that, that sort of thing. The laptop can handle any kind of productivity task that you want to throw at it and pro app stuff that 1050 Ti is plenty enough, or 1050 even, to make Adobe CC applications fly. And there's a lot of diminishing returns there with Adobe CC and most pro apps where beyond a certain point, the GPU isn't going to really make much of a difference. When you're up to the 1050, you're pretty much at the sweet spot for your pro apps sort of work. And if you're doing some ZBrush and some 3D CAD work, it, it's adequate for certainly college level work. Yeah, definitely. Benchmarks fall pretty much right where we would expect them to, and you can see them on screen here, and it's pretty competitive with the Inspiron 15 Gamer that we recently reviewed. Uh, that one has a 1050 Ti, so it gets a little bit higher scores on graphics, except for, for some reason, time spot. The Acer actually did better, but for all the other tests, Dell did score a bit higher, as it should, because it has a better GPU inside. So as an overall pro apps laptop going to college, you need to do some coding, some 3D work, CAD, that sort of thing, gaming for sure. Yeah, it's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to do the job. Now, when gaming, with today's most demanding titles, for example, we got Mass Infect Andromeda demoed here, and they really recommend having a 1060. But we're playing with that 1050, and it, it did just fine on medium settings. We started out multiplayer in low, and it capped at VSync at 60 frames per second. So I thought, well, let's challenge a little bit more. So then I switched to single player, which usually has more details, a little more demanding. Bumped that up to medium settings, playing at native 1080p resolution. And it still managed to keep the game pretty much capped at 60 frames per second. So that's, that's not bad at all. If you're playing something like Battlefield 1, expect to play it on low and medium settings mix. You, you get the idea there. You're not going to get the highest textures and ultra settings or something because this is still what we call a budget gaming laptop. But you can play the newest titles on it. Huzzah! Another thing I really like about this is the Wi-Fi. Very strong. It's Qualcomm Atheros. This is not killer branded Wi-Fi, though they are the folks behind killer networking. Very impressive reception and throughput. I was farther from our access point than I normally ever would be with a laptop and didn't see a drop in throughput at all. It's really good wireless here. And obviously there's Bluetooth as well. Something I don't like so much, bloatware. I mean, there's just, you have Firefox bundles. When was the last time you saw a Firefox bundle? You've got Netflix, you've got some casual games, you've got some of Acer's services that really I don't think anybody uses. And another plus is the battery life. Now, gaming laptops don't usually have very good battery life, but this one, well, it helps it has NVIDIA Optimus, so it can switch back and forth with Intel HD 630 graphics when you're not doing something graphically intensive, but there are plenty of laptops that have that feature. But our model with the 1050 Ti and the Core i5 quad-core CPU inside, we average about 6.4 hours of non-gaming use with brightness set to 40%, which is about 140 nits or so. That's really pretty impressive for a gaming laptop, especially given the fact that the battery is not that big. It's a 52.5 watt hour three cell battery inside. And heck, we've seen some 13 and 14 inch Ultrabooks these days with only dual cores and integrated graphics that have that size battery. So how they did it, I don't know, but they did it. And the charger is normal size for, for this level of graphics and CPU inside. It's a 135 watt charger. Not too, too huge. It's not like one of those giant gaming rigs where the power brick weighs as much as an Ultrabook.
So that's the Acer Aspire VX15. It's easy on the muscles, pretty portable, fairly compact, reasonably powerful too. Obviously this is not gonna be your top of the line Acer Predator kind of machine, but the price for what you get is really very good. And as you heard, it really holds up well against the Dell Inspiron 15 Gaming Edition because that one has a meh display unless you opt for 4K. In this case, the 1080p IPS display is very, very usable. Thumbs up for this one. I'm Lisa from Mobile Tech Review. Be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel for more cool tech videos and thumbs up if you like this video.